Hey guys, it's Mr. Schmidt here, and in this video I want to talk about economic systems. So, we've encountered before the idea of scarcity, the idea that we live in a world where there's unlimited wants, but limited resources. And once a society confronts the fact that scarcity is a problem, the economic system is really a society's answer to the problem, which is how do we decide who gets the goods and services produced by limited resources, right? And every economic system has to answer three basic questions. The first being, what goods and services are we going to produce, right? Are we going to make cars? Are we going to make trains? Are we going to make computers? Are we going to make paper printers? What are we going to make? Once we decide what we're going to make, you can see how these questions kind of go in order and build off each other. How should these goods and services be produced, right? Um, what methods should we use to make them, right? There, there's multiple ways, for example, to, to make a smartphone, right? There's different um, processes you could use, different chips, that kind of thing, different uh, software systems, different hardware, right? And then once we decide uh, what goods and services we're going to make, how we're going to make them, then who's going to get them, right? Um, and, and how do we decide who gets them? Is it, is it whoever can afford them? Is it whoever needs them the most? Is it whoever the government says? There's a lot of different ways to tackle these three questions. But the answers to these three questions form the basis for an economic system. And so there are two really large categories of economic systems. I will go ahead and mention two others that you sometimes see down here at the bottom. Um, there are also what were called traditional economies. Um, these are very, very rare anymore. They're very agricultural based. Um, today, probably if you were to visit some remote tribes, um, that might be a traditional economy, but we really don't see these anymore in the modern age. And the other one, which is probably by far the most common, is a mixed economy, which is a combination of these two that I'm going to talk about up here in the table, command and market. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about them. So command economies, you can see here in red, and market or capitalistic economies, you can see in blue. Um, and I've categorized them by these four questions. The first one is, who answers three questions? In other words, who's in charge of making the decisions about what are we going to make, how are we going to make it, and who gets it? And in command economies, it's all about the government. The government's deciding who gets what, how it's going to be made, what's going to be made. The resources to make the goods are controlled by the government. And that's really key because if you control the resources, you get to dictate what gets made, right? Because nothing really can be made without your approval. There is no protection of property rights. So property rights is the idea that anything that is yours that you own if someone tries to steal or take it from you, the government will intervene to, to stop them, right? And so the idea of property rights is not at all important in the command economy because people don't really own that much property, right? Everything's publicly owned by the government and the government distributes what it wants to the people. And so property rights really aren't a thing. And then finally, prices don't really play that much of a role in a command economy because again, everything's kind of, given out by the government, right? And so you're not, you're not really buying as much, uh, that type of thing. It's going to be more given to you by the government. And command economies, and I'll give you uh, an example here of a command economy, which would be uh, North Korea, at least in the modern day. In, in the abstract, a, a command economy actually sounds like a pretty good idea, right? The government can decide who needs what, who should get what, then uh, every person can get exactly what they need, right? If someone needs a pencil, they get a pencil. If someone needs uh, water, they get water. Whatever it is uh, that, that someone doesn't have, they can get. But command economies are rife with corruption because when you put all the resources, all the power in the hands of a small group of people, they quickly realize, hmm, why don't we just keep all of this for ourselves and give the people very, very little? And that's what actually goes on in countries like North Korea, where you have a small group of people at the very top who have all the power, all the wealth, all the resources, 
and the vast majority of people live in abject poverty. And then the other side of the coin are market or capitalistic economies. And these economies are very, very government get out of the way. Uh, buyers and sellers answer these three questions. In other words, what gets produced, how, how it gets produced, and who gets it is dictated really by consumers and producers and their interactions, right? So, for example, if sellers learn that you know consumers want a, a flying car, then flying cars get made, right? If it's if at all possible, and so that that's what determines what gets produced in a market economy. Now, in terms of resource control, it's done privately in a market economy. Individuals control the resources, not the government. And so we'll talk about later in this unit on factor markets, how those resources are bought and sold to make goods and services. Property rights are essential in a market economy because producers aren't going to make stuff if they feel like both their property and their intellectual property are going to get taken at any moment. And so it's very important that property is protected in a market economy so entrepreneurship can happen, businesses get developed, that type of a thing. And then finally, prices send signals to both buyers and sellers about what to purchase and what to sell, right? Prices dictate that, right? So if, for instance, if I go in a store and I see something that's overpriced in my opinion, I don't buy it, and a bunch of other consumers join me in that opinion, it sends a signal to sellers saying, wait, this is priced way too high. We need to lower the price on it. Uh, for example, when the Nintendo Wii U came out, um, and I don't remember the date or the year that it came out, uh, but it was several years ago from the date of this video, um, it was overpriced. Like a lot of people were not buying it, and Nintendo was forced to lower the price to generate uh, sales. An example of price signals, right? So prices co uh, basically coordinate where should resources go, where should goods and services go, which is the function that the government plays in a command economy. Now, in terms of examples of, of market economies, uh, the typical example people give is the United States. But what I like to say is this is really uh, the United States pre-1900. Because after 1900, you start seeing more and more of a role of the government in the economy and it really starts to make uh, the United States more of a mixed economy, where there's a government role and a private sector role in the economy. And in fact, most economies today are mixed economies, some form of market and command, where there's some private sector stuff, some public sector stuff uh, to, to make the economy work. Very few economies are pure command economies and hardly any are pure market. It's hard to think of an example today of a pure market economy. So that's all for this video on economic systems. Until next time, have a great day.